بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ان گڈ ڈے ایوری ون آئی ڈاکٹر سادیاتا ویلکم یو آل آن بورڈ ٹوڈے وی آر گونا ڈسکس دا ٹاپک آف ٹرانسفرس میگزیلری ڈیفیشنسی سو ایٹ دا اینڈ آف دا ٹاپک یو شیل بی ایبل ٹو نو دیٹ واٹ ٹرانسفرس میگزیلری ڈیفیشنسی از واٹ آر دا ویریس اسٹیجز آف کلاسیفیکیشن آف دا مڈ پیلٹل سوچر What are the indications and classification of arch expansion? What are the various appliances that are used to treat the transverse maxillary deficiency? And what are the various choice of appliances which are required in different age groups? So moving towards the transverse maxillary deficiency, if we say that the maxilla is narrow with reference to the rest of the face we term it as transverse maxillary deficiency so transverse maxillary deficiency can be uh, assessed clinically uh, and on smile analysis whereas uh, on dental casts as well uh, on dental cast we may see the narrowing of the width of the premolars and the molar teeth where and the narrowing of the palatal vault uh, whereas on smile analysis as we can see in this patient as well there will be excessive dark buccal corridors on the clinical examination and the intraoral examination we may see the lingual cross bites all this signs signifies that there is transverse maxillary deficiency in this patient so how we proceed with the transverse maxillary deficiency is we can open the mid parietal suture uh, through various de- devices and various uh, Uh, techniques uh, before uh, uh, discussion uh, discussing the expansion and the opening of the mid palatal suture uh, i think uh, i would like to discuss the various stages of ossification of ma- mid palatal suture the, uh, there are four stages of ossification of the mid palatal suture Uh, stage 1 is uh, at infancy stage 2 is early childhood or early mixed dentition stage c is late uh, mixed dentition or the pre adolescence age and stage 4 we divide it at uh, into late teens in infancy if we look at the suture we see that the suture is just like a straight line which shows that the suture has not started to ossify or it uh, there are no interdigitations in the mid palatal suture at this stage there is no palatal expansion needed now talking about childhood or early mixed dentition as we can see here in the diagram there is slight interdigitation of the mid palatal suture um, therefore any expansion device in early childhood or early mixed dentition can be used for expansion um a, the device which are even delivering light forces can be used here because the suture has not interdigitated to a point that heavy force will be required so this is a picture depicting the suture at the early adolescence here we can see that there is more interdigitation of the suture and uh, the spicules in the suture uh, sutures they have reached to a point that heavy forces will be required to break this interdigitations therefore in early adolescence heavy forces are required to break this interdigitations and a heavy force with a jack screw especially is required for expansion in early adolescence uh, now talking about the late teens in late teens what happens is that the suture maturity and the interdigitation has reached to a point that uh, fusion of the uh, that the bre- the breakage or the um, interdigitations of the suture cannot be uh, broken with the help of any device in this stage we use uh, modified procedures or the surgical procedures in order to require uh, in order to uh, in order to provide expansion therefore uh, the areas of bony bridging have established and skeletal maxillary expansion become impossible with simple devices we will be proceeding with the surgery that i'll be discussing in the coming slides now talking about expansion uh, in expansion what happens is the transverse force is given across the mid palatal suture in children and in adolescents before the fusion of the mid palatal suture that usually happens around 16 to 18 years of age 
um, the expansion of the suture is possible. Uh, the expansion of the uh, force can be delivered by various expansion devices as well as by a jack screw device. The jack screw device is capable of providing all types of forces to the uh, uh, to the uh, maxilla. The maxilla opens on a hinge if when we apply the force uh, to the jack screw device and we open the separate the maxilla the maxilla opens on a hinge that it opens more anteriorly and less posteriorly this is because the suture begins to fuse posteriorly and then it fuses anteriorly therefore more expansion will be achieved anteriorly and less expansion will be achieved posteriorly which is shown here in the picture as well where we can see that there is a gap between the incisors. What happens if we provide a rapid expansion or heavy, uh, heavy expansion forces in a preschool children? Uh, there are certain disadvantages. It is important to realize that the heavy force and rapid expansion should not be used in preschool children because of the risk of producing undesirable changes. And what are those undesirable changes? As this picture, we can see this is a pre-op picture of the girl. Her nose, it is not having any nasal hump, any swelling in the perinasal area. Whereas after rapid expansion, as happened in this girl, we can see the development of a nasal hump, a prominent nasal hump, a paranasal swelling, the widening of the lower widths of the nose, whereas tissue damage and hemorrhage. These are the risks if we uh, go for rapid expansion in a pre-adolescent or a preschool children. Therefore, rapid expansion of preschool children is contraindicated. There is a video I'll be sharing this with you later. <coughs> So what are the various indications of arch expansion? We will be doing arch expansion in the patients uh, in, which we think, uh, we, in which we need to correct the posterior cross spine. And uh, the patients who are having V-shaped or uh, pellet or a narrow palatal vault, the patients in which we are preparing uh, for a bone craft, especially uh, in a cleft alveolus, Whereas patients with minimal crowding in the upper arch or as I discussed earlier, uh, the patients having a dark buccal corridors, all these are indications for arch expansion. Now we classify expansion as dentoalveolar and skeletal expansion. Here we can see that this jack screw device is uh, attached to the dentition. So by the dentoalveolar expansion, we mean that when the expander, we will be opening the expander, the force will be transmitted to the teeth and the teeth will move in their dentoalveolar housing. The, that transverse movement or transverse expansion of the teeth in, the, um, in their dentoalveolar housing is termed as dentoalveolar expansion. Where is the, the expansion that is happening across the mid palatal suture and the uh, skeletal basis will come under the category of skeletal expansion. So there are two types of expansion that is the dentoalveolar expansion and skeletal expansion. In dentoalveolar expansion the alveolar housing and the dentition is moving and, uh, and is contributing to the expansion of the maxilla whereas in skeletal expansion the, the expansion is happening across the mid palatal suture. Now we can achieve this expansion through various ways uh, that is by slowly expanding the palate or by hard, uh, by rapidly expanding the palate. Uh, in between them lies the criteria of a semi-rapid expansion uh, and a fourth category is the implant supported expansion in which the implants are used and the skeletal anchorage is used to achieve expansion. I'll be discussing them uh, one by one. Firstly, we'll be discussing rapid palatal expansion. Uh, well, the major goal of rapid palatal expansion was to maximize the skeletal change and minimize the dental change that is actually needed in cases of expansion. Therefore, the theory behind uh, the rapid palatal expansion that was suggested was uh, that if uh, a rapid force application is uh, done to the posterior teeth of the maxilla 
there would not be enough time for tooth movement the force will be transferred directly to the suture and that will open up the suture while the tooth move uh, move only a little which is which means that when we apply a very heavy force to the maxilla that force majorly will be transferred directly to the suture causing the separation of the suture hence causing greater skeletal change uh, so, in order to complete this theory, the uh, in rapid palatal expansion, what we do is that we activate the uh, activate the device uh, 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 0.5 to 1 millimeter a day. That uh, accounts for around uh, 10 millimeters of expansion in two to three weeks. Okay. Initially, what happens in rapid palatal expansion is a greater skeletal change and lesser dental change as suggested by the theory. So, if uh, we say that 10 millimeters of expansion is achieved in 2 to 3 weeks, almost 80% of that expansion is the skeletal expansion and 20% of that expansion is the dental expansion. But uh, and the and definitely a very heavy force is generated in order to uh, set apart the two so, uh, the two parts of two halves of the maxilla at the mid palatal suture. Um, so if we discuss the rapid palatal expansion, uh, the skeletal change is there with a the rapid force application to the posterior teeth. Activation rate in case of rapid palatal expansion is 0.5 to 1 millimeter per day. The force generated is very heavy, that is around 20 pounds. Um, the amount of expansion that we achieve is around 10 millimeters in 2 to 3 weeks. Uh, what happens is, uh, when the two halves of the maxilla are set apart so quickly, a space appears between the two central between the central incisors in rapid palatal expansion, as we can see in this diagram. Now, talking about the drawbacks of this expansion, this expansion, because it's happening so quickly, so fastly, it is uh, highly unstable because the two half of the maxilla, the bone cannot be generated so fast. So what happens is the area uh, in which the two halves of the maxilla or, so, uh, or the palate are uh, set apart is filled with tissue damage and hemorrhage it is a very aggressive option it is very less stable and there are high chances of relapse so uh, overall uh, expansion is uh, very prone to relapse so expansion must be stabilized but in case of rapid expansion because there is no bone in between uh, filling the mid palatal suture area so and th that area is basically uh, covered by the hemorrhage and the tissue damage it is very very less stable the expansion device must be stabilized uh, so that the screw must not shut itself back in place mm, the uh, uh, now as i mentioned earlier sorry as I mentioned earlier, the expansion achieved in rapid palatal expansion initially is 80% of the skeletal change and 20% of the dental change. But what happens is, when in, during the phase of uh, stab stabilization, what happens is that the bony segments, they reposition themselves while the teeth are held in place. Because we are holding the teeth in place with the help of the same appliance, but because there is no bone in between, the bony segments come back together towards each other which causes a skeletal relapse um, uh, and what happens is for example if uh, 10 millimeter of expansion is achieved initially which was 8, eight uh, millimeter due to the skeletal change and 10, 2 millimeter due to the dental change at 4 months what happened the same 10 millimeter of the dental expansion will be maintained because uh, the device is in place but uh, at that point there would only be 5 millimeter of your skeletal change and expansion and the rest of the expansion will be on account of the dental changes um, which means that there is a skeletal relapse the maxilla mag two halves of the maxilla come back together therefore at the end of rapid palatal expansion what we achieve is five percent uh, five millimeter of the skeletal change and five millimeter of the dental change that accounts for 50 percent of the skeletal change and 50 percent of the dental change now, talking to uh, talking about the slow expansion, 
what happens is that we are activating the screw slowly that is 0.25 millimeters or one quarter turn every alternate day in case of slow expansion now it is more physiologic because uh, 0.5 millimeter of the bone fill happen physiologically um, if uh, in any area if it is done uh, because the tissue of the mid palatal suture can adapt to that change. So what happens is almost 0.5 to 1 millimeter of the expansion or is achieved in a week. It is more physiologic. The tissue of the mid palatal, uh, at the separation at the mid palatal suture is uh, basically filled by the uh, tissue and uh, well, the mid palatal tissue. Uh, it, sorry, it is basically filled by the bone. Therefore, it is more physiologic, less hemorrhage, less tissue damage is there, and more, uh, more of the bone is there, so it is more stable. The amount of, um, <coughs> sorry, the amount of uh, uh, activation that is done is 0.25 millimeter every alternate day that is uh, one quarter turn every other day the force generated in this case will be very low that will range between two to four pounds and we are achieving around 0.5 to one millimeter of expansion in a week uh, it is more physiologic it is more stable it is causing less damage it is causing less tissue damage uh, the amount of active, uh, the palatal expansion that is achieved is 10 millimeter expansion in 10 weeks which is uh, almost similar to the end result that we achieved with the rapid palatal expansion because rapid, in rapid palatal expansion initially we got 80% skeletal change, 20% dental change and finally after stabilization after four months what we get was 50% uh, of the skeletal and 50% of the dental change um, here in slow expansion as 50% uh, of the skeletal and 50% of the dental change is present initially and that change is maintained finally uh, so 10 in uh, 10 millimeter of expansion 5% 50% sorry 5 millimeter is your skeletal change 5 millimeter is your dental change it is more physiologic it is more stable and it and same time is required for uh, both expansions so when we compare the slow expansion the rapid expansion uh, the in slow expansion both skeletal and the dental changes can be seen from the beginning whereas in rapid expansion predominantly skeletal changes present initially the rate of expansion in slow expansion is slow in rapid it's fast uh, it is more physiologic it is more traumatic the rapid expansion whereas the forces used in slow expansion are mild forces and uh, rapid expansion causes generates heavy forces which is, which is not good whereas in slow expansion 0.5 to 1 millimeter expansion is achieved in a week and here 0.5 to 1 millimeter expansion is achieved in a day which is definitely not um, not covered by the tissue and the palatal tissue is not adapting to it so a midline diastema is there and tissue hemorrhage and tissue damage is there the duration of treatment in slow expansion is long, uh, but it is more stable. The duration of treatment in rapid expansion is short. The type of appliance that is preferable in, for slow expansion is either a fixed or a removable, whereas appliance that is used for rapid expansion is a fixed appliance. Slow expansion can be done at any age, uh, whereas in rapid expansion it sh must be done before the pre of the mid palatal suture. And retention, um, when we talk about the relapse, there are more chances of relapse in rapid palatal expansion. And this is a very, these are very important differences between the slow expansion and rapid expansion. Um, now, talking about the implant supported expansion. In implant supported expansion, no um, support is taken from the dental structures, as can be seen in this picture. All the support is taken, taken directly from the from the skeletal structures the implants are placed in the palate and the expansion is taken with the help of these implants so uh, it produces almost total skeletal change um, therefore therefore uh, 
uh, it can expand the maxilla even if there are no teeth present uh, and it, uh, it is done when we really need to avoid the tooth movements and it produces almost skeletal changes with the jack screw if it is attached to the skeletal anchors minimum disruption of the suture will be desired so in case of implant supported expansion slow rather than rapid expansion would be indicated so till now we have discussed the types of expansion that are dental alveolar and the skeletal expansion the rapid expansion slow expansion and plant supported expansion in rapid expansion the rate of expansion is 0.5 millimeter to 1 millimeter a day in slow expansion is 0.5 to 1 millimeter a week and whereas in implant support we will talk that it is not talk, taking any support from the dental structures it is almost almost a skeletal change so therefore a rapid expansion is not needed in case of a implant supported retention now no matter uh, expansion is achieved which uh, by any mean a retainer is needed even after the bone fill in seems complete the uh, the best choice is that the expansion appliance should remain in place for at least three to four months then it can be uh, replaced with a removable retainer or other retention devices mm, uh, the, here is an expansion device that is shown i'll be discussing the various types of other expansion devices uh, with which a retainer uh, with which an expander can be replaced with either the expansion should be stabilized with the same appliance that is the same appliance is left in place for three to four months or it can be stabilized by a acrylic retainer here we can see a TPA extended arms this is a transpalatal arch connecting both molars extended arms that are extending uh, anteriorly which will not let the intercanine interpremolar and the intermolar width to relapse or it can be achieved with a heavy labial arch wire um, that is the arch wire a heavy wire eye wire is placed labially so any of these devices can be used as a retainer uh, in order to prevent relapse in cases of expansion now if the suture has fused that is the patient has surpassed the age of 16 or 16 to 18 almost then the choice of uh, expansion with the expansion devices is almost almost uh, mm, almost when um, uh, in uh, in growing patients, we go for the uh, the applied devices like RX or the other devices which I'll be discussing later. Whereas if the growth is over, we'll be going for the surgical procedures in the patients in order to overcome the problems of uh, transverse maxillary deficiency and the growth has been over. Uh, SARMI is suggested. SARMI stands for surgically assisted rapid maxillary expansion, which means that in non-growing patient surgical expansion of the maxilla is a must what have, uh, what we do in sarmi is uh, there are circummaxillary suture splits um, that are visible in these photographs that uh, the circummaxillary sutures are split and a mid palatal suture is split and an expander device is, pla in, is placed and then expansion is achieved because it's not only the mid palatal suture that has fused in the non growing patient, all the circummaxillary sutures have also fused. Therefore, circummaxillary split along with the mid palatal split is done in surgically assisted rapid maxillary expansion. And then the palate is expanded and the two halves of the, uh, the palate are separated with the help of a screw or a jack screw device. So, it, uh, the SARMI, it claims that there is less periodontal support loss and there is increase in the nasal air flow because it is widening the nasal base as well. There are certain disadvantages or complications that can happen with the surgically assisted rapid maxillary expansion. That is over expansion. If we cause over expansion of the jack screw device, it can cause a scissors bite that is bilateral buccal cross bite as seen in this patient 
here yes and it can cause possible periodontal damage in case of over expansion and if we over expand there are chances of a palatal cuspal hang of the molars which may lead to increase in the maxillomandibular plane angle and a lower uh, and increase of the lower facial height therefore it may worse the anterior open bite so these are the following complications which can happen with sarmi that is uh, over expansion can cause a scissors bite and um, periodontal damage and increase in the lower facial height and if the patient is having a tendency of anterior open bite it may worsen with the palatal hang now we'll be discussing the appliances that are used for expansion they can be removable they can be fixed uh, the this is a picture of a removable appliance here it is attached with the labial bow and atom clasp on the molars and um, a mini screw is uh, placed in acrylic in the mid palette this is a hyrex expander it is known as hyrex because it is com it stands for hygienic rapid expander it is not having uh, any acrylic anywhere in the palette and it is taking support from the dentition it is a fixed expander this is a w arch it is used for expansion and this is a quad helix just like w arch the difference is it is having four helices as we can see to anterior to posterior um, it incorporates an uh, increased uh, length of wire therefore it decreases the force that is been provided or applied to, uh, to the dentition now this is a transpalatal arch all of these devices are the expansion devices we'll be discussing which device to use and where to use it this is a higher, uh, this is a hair expander it is taking support from the dentition but it is having acrylic incorporated in the palate with a mid palatal screw this is a coil springs expander so all of these are our expansion devices now, as we have discussed earlier, that before the fusion of the mid-palatal suture, we can go for expansion. Um, we can go for expansion, okay? But uh, there are certain indications in which early expansion uh, is asked. Uh, we, what are the following conditions in which we should be going for early expansion? Uh, we should be going for early expansion cases where we want to eliminate the mandibular shifts and closure. For example, in patients where there is a cross bite, a posterior cross bite, and the patient is shifting the mandible um, to close in a better occlusion, in those cases, early expansion is early expansion is <clears throat> indicated and in cases where we, uh, we need more space for erupting maxillary teeth in those cases we'll be needing the early expansion uh, in order to lessen the dental arch distortion and to lessen the potential of tooth abrasion from interferences of anterior teeth and in order to reduce the possibility of mandibular skeletal asymmetry these are the following cases in which early expansion is indicated now we'll be discussing the expansion uh, devices and the expansion protocols that should be needed uh, in pre-adolescent children and then we'll be discussing the uh, uh, expansion in the late mixed dentition so in uh, pre-adolescent children less uh, force is needed to open the suture because it is relatively easy to obtain the palatal expansion therefore it may be obtained by a split removable plate that is a removable plate with a jack screw or a lingual arch that is uh, as i showed you the pictures the w arch or the quad helix or a fixed expander with a jack screw that is hyrex hyrex co uh, we classify as banded and bonded i'll be discussing it later so all three of these appliances can be used uh, for expansion in pre-adolescent children but um, now i'll be discussing them one by one um, with a removable appliance the rate of expansion is slow uh, and multiple clasps are are incorporated in the wire therefore it is highly technique sensitive because of the instability of the teeth during the expansion process 
Failure to wear the appliance even for one day requires adjustment of the appliance by the practitioner. Therefore, it is highly, highly compliance dependent. Even if the patient fails to wear the appliance for one day, it may not be sitting in again because of the relapse. On, therefore, the compliance is very much the and the wear time is always an issue and patient has to activate the appliance himself it is not cost effective because successful expansion with a removable appliance can so take so much time in that in terms of time it is not cost effective therefore uh, what are the various disadvantages of using uh, removable expansion in early mixed dentition uh, that it uh, it takes so much time so in terms of time it's not cost effective it is very much compliance dependent even if the patient uh, fails to wear the appliance on one day the adjustments must be needed by the practitioner because of the instability of uh, the results and uh, instability of the mid palatal suture and the expansion rate is very slow with such appliances so the second modality of treatment that can be used in pre was lingual arches and the, the that, that is the W arch or the quad helix arch. These are the fixed appliances. They deliver slow, continuous forces. They are activated outside the mouth or inside the mouth by the practitioner. Therefore, the compliance is not needed by the, um, by the patient. Uh, it is not compliance dependent in terms of uh, activation, in terms of uh, removal. It is a relatively clean appliance. It is reasonably effective. It is de delivering few hundred grams of forces. It is providing slow expansion. And that slow expansion is uh, provided by one third of the skeletal and two third of the dental change. Therefore, these are good appliances to use for expansion in uh, early mixed dentition. Uh, now talking about the fixed jack screw appliances, uh, they can be attached to the bed as we can see in this picture. They are this fixed jack screw is attached with the help of bands or they can be bonded that is uh, they can be attached with the help of acrylic. So uh, they can they must be managed carefully uh, because uh, still uh, again they are very um, compliance dependent because they have to be activated by the patient himself or herself. Uh, they are bulky appliances, um, the bending at times is difficult in these cases, cleaning is difficult in these cases, uh, although they can deliver uh, all type of forces that is semi-rapid, uh, rapid and slow depending upon the activation or the turns you are providing to them. Uh, but uh, comparatively they are difficult because the patient uh, has to activate it themselves and then they again become compliance dependent in that aspect. If we compare the lingual arches with the jack screw appliances, uh, firstly the jack screw appliances they are more bulkier, they are more difficult to place and remove. The patient has problem cleaning it, uh, they cause more soft tissue irritation and the patient or the parent must activate the appliance which made them compliance dependent and if we compare uh, these uh, disadvantages of jack screw with the lingual arch so these are the advantages of lingual arch that they are less bulky they are more easy to clean they are more easy to place and remove uh, there's less so soft tissue irritation and the patient doesn't have to activate them himself or herself and secondly <clears throat> Uh, the appliance, uh, the jack screw appliance must be monitored very carefully while activate, uh, activation because it uh, can be activated rapidly which in young children is a contraindication as we discussed earlier. It may cause paranasal swellings, it may cause uh, uh, nasal hump, it may cause widening of the alveolar earth, it may cause tissue damage, hemorrhage, so on and so forth. Therefore, in uh, pre-adolescent uh, children, we reached to a conclusion that slow expansion with an active lingual arch is a preferred approach to maxillary constriction in young children in the primary and early mixed dentition therefore lingual arches are more preferred but in cases when we are using <coughs> the jack screw appliances then they must be activated very carefully in pre-adolescent or in early mixed dentition 
Now moving towards the palatal expansion in the late mixed dentition. What happens in the late mixed dentition is the mid palatal suture becomes more interdigitated. Um, therefore, a heavier forces is need, a, a heavier forces need to break to break the mid palatal suture. Um, uh, and that heavy force can be provided by a jack screw appliance that cannot be provided by the lingual appliance like W arch or a quad helix as we mentioned earlier that they provide slow forces therefore expansion in the late mixed dentition of one requires a heavy force with the help of a jack screw um, now expansion uh, now till when we can uh, use a jack screw for expansion in late mix dentition uh, the expansion may be possible up to the end of the adolescent growth spurt that is around the age of 15 to 18 years um, now, and the choice in the uh, late mix dentition is a fixed jack screw appliance now we'll be deciding whether we are going to use a banded appliance or a bonded appliance here there are the picture this is a bonded appliance that is incorporating acrylic over the tooth structure and this is a banded appliance which is having bands over the tooth structure and no acrylic is present in between both is a jack screw so what happens is when we use a banded appliance and we expand the maxilla transversely there's a chance of palatal hang of the uh, palatal hang by palatal hang i mean that the palatal cusps they move down they grow vertically when they are expanded transversely which may cause uh, the increase in the lower facial height therefore a banded appliance is contraindicated in low uh, high angle patients whereas in bonded appliance the uh, the chances of vertical hang is very low therefore they may be used in cases of vertical uh, vertical facial excess uh, in the lower third the, um, uh, which means that in cases of <clears throat> banded appliances uh, we, th they will be of choice uh, if the patient is a low angle case uh, for example where the increase in the lower facial third is favorable whereas in patients we having a normal to high facial uh, height proportion a banded appliance will be the appliance of choice because it will not be increasing the vertical facial dimension uh, as uh, much as compared to the banded appliance therefore uh, to come to a conclusion bonded are used in cases of high vertical proportion where banding or banded apply expanders are used in cases of low vertical proportions now coming to uh, uh, rapid or slow expansion that which expansion is favorable which is good and when to do uh, which expansion a slower activation of the uh, expansion appliance provides approximately the same ultimate result over a 10 to 12 week period as the rapid expansion which we talked earlier that 50 percent of the skeletal 50 percent of the dental changes are the ultimate changes in both rapid and slow expansion in slow expansion 50 percent of the dental 50 percent of the skeletal uh, throughout from beginning to the end in rapid expansion 80 percent of the skeletal change in 20 percent of the dental change is seen initially whereas in fi finally 50 percent of the dental and and 50% of the skeletal change remains because of the skeletal relapse. Less trauma to the teeth and bones is present in case of slow expansion. Um, now talking about expansion, primary and early mixed dentition. Therefore, the appliance of choice in uh, for primary and early mixed dentition will be the lingual arches, either the W arch or the quad helix. Expansion in the late, late mixed dentition always requires uh, a uh, fixed jack screw device either bonded or banded depending upon the facial proportions mm, and expansion in adults is carried out with the help of sarmi that is surgically assisted rapid maxillary expansion i'll be sharing the videos uh, and their links with you soon and the take home messages if there is no struggle there is no progress so stay happy stay blessed stay safe allah hafiz